Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this week's webcast on snowshoeing. My name is Aaron Robertson, Communications Manager for Oregon Wild. Um, I'm going to do a little housekeeping before we get started. Even though we've been hosting these webcasts almost every Wednesday since April, this is our first time doing so with Zoom. So if we have a few hiccups along the way, I hope you'll bear with us as we get used to this new platform. You can enter your questions at any time using the chat interface. Those questions will go to me and I'll ask them at the end of the presentation as we have time. A recording of this webcast will be emailed out tomorrow and it will also be posted on our website, oregonwild.org in the wild blog section. If you got a raffle ticket, I wanna thank you. Your support allows us to continue doing these presentations and our work safeguarding Oregon's wildlands, wildlife, and waters. Uh, winners for that raffle will be contacted by email tomorrow to verify their shipping addresses. So if you bought a raffle ticket, watch your email uh, inbox because we'll wanna make sure that we are sending your prize to the right place. Now, barring some pretty big news, this will be our last Wild Wednesday of 2020, and we'll resume these back in January. But we do have something completely different coming next week. On Monday at 7 p.m., we'll have the premiere of Wild Night Tonight, which is Oregon Wild's end of the year late night show featuring special guests, music, and comedy. It's about a half an hour program, and it's a lot of fun. Um, so we'll hope you'll tune in to join us for that premiere. Um, you can sign up for that at OregonWild.org. And now that I'm done with the introduction, I'm going to turn things over to Eric Fernandez, who is the Wilderness Program Manager for Oregon Wild. Eric's going to give you a short overview of Oregon Wild for those of you who might be new to these programs, and then dive into some tips and tricks for making the most out of your winter snowshoe adventures. Take it away, Eric. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Get my screen share going here. Does that look like it's coming through? Yep. All right. Well, thanks uh, for that introduction. So um, uh, Oregon Wild is a nonprofit conservation organization. We've been around for uh, almost 50 years now, and um, we work on uh, protecting, uh, we'll, we'll go through uh, some background on Oregon Wild, um, and then I'm going to get into some social gear uh, information, and then we will uh, go through some tips and some safety ideas. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, snowshoeing destinations in Central Oregon and where and when to choose which one to go to. So that's kind of our, our agenda for the next uh, uh, little while here. So uh, again, on Oregon Wild, one of the things we do is we work on protecting wildlife habitat, um, both from wildlife refuges to wolves. And yes, uh, technically, we do work on protecting Ewok habitat. Star Wars aficionados will know that Ewoks live in redwood forests, and we do have some redwood forests in uh, Oregon, down on the, the very south coast, uh, that, and Oregon Wild has been working on protecting those for years. So the Ewoks are, are part of the organizational mission. All right, uh, you may also uh, be familiar with other places we've worked on protecting over the years, like Opal Creek Wilderness, uh, the Mount Jefferson Wilderness, um, these are the ice caves up on Mount Hood. This was the largest ice cave um, in the lower 48 states up until a few years ago. Uh, parts of it caved in. Ice caves are, evolve over time fairly quickly. Um, we also have worked on protecting the Mount Thielson wilderness over the years. This is uh, near Crater Lake. This is known as the, the lightning rod of the Cascades. It's a very sharp, distinct uh, summit there. And then other lesser known places uh, out in the John Day watershed, like Strawberry Mountain Wilderness, um, a, a place most people haven't been to, but um, beautiful, important uh, wildlife uh, area as well. And then closer to home here in Central Oregon, um, uh, the, the view that a lot of us see from uh, driving around town here in Bend or elsewhere is the, the Three Sisters Wilderness. And um, that's a, a really place, a really important uh, wilderness area here in Central Oregon. So I have one quiz question for you. This is the only quiz question of the whole evening. Um, what percentage of the state of Oregon do you think has been permanently protected? Kind of looking at the whole state, northeast, southwest, and I'll give you a couple hints. Uh, Washington state has protected 10% of their state permanently as wilderness. If you look at California, a little more progressive state, they've protected about 15% of their state. And so Oregon, 
got a green reputation, but uh, unfortunately we have only protected about 4% of the state, uh, which is really surprising. And in permanent protection, that means uh, not uh, administrative plans that change all the time. This is like the gold standard of wilderness protection. Um, and, and the most embarrassing part of this statistic is that the liberal progressive bastion of Idaho has uh, protected twice as much of their state permanently as wilderness. So uh, we have our work to do here in Oregon uh, cut out for us to make sure we're doing a, a good enough job of protecting the natural treasures that make us uh, such a great and amazing state for people and for wildlife. So uh, uh, along those lines, uh, uh, run through a couple places that we are currently working on protecting. Um, here in Central Oregon, the Ochoco Mountains, I think more and more people are discovering this area as the, the Cascades get a little bit more crowded. Um, this photo is the, some of the old growth ponderosa pine trees uh, on Lookout Mountain. Pretty awesome spot uh, if you haven't been there. Um, also working on designating new wild and scenic river protected corridors uh, for our most important waterways in the state. Uh, that top picture there is the South Umpqua and the bottom photo there is uh, Odell Creek. Um, also working on protecting, if you've driven up from Bend up towards Mount Bachelor the last few years, you've probably seen a whole lot of logging. Um, we've been working really hard to make sure that that logging isn't any more aggressive than it already is, making sure that the old growth trees are not the ones that are cut down. Um, some of that's been, okay logging. Some of it has been more aggressive than we think it should have been. Um, that's one of the things we're working on. These trees here are just off Cascade Lakes Highway that were slated to be cut, but we were able to win protections for those. So sometimes it's one tree at a time, sometimes it's uh, one watershed at a time. All right, diving into snowshoes and all of the gear. I'm going to switch out here for just a second. Um, so the first thing, your snowshoes, um, a lot of snowshoes out there on the market. My suggestion is that if you're interested in getting snowshoes, before you buy them, um, try renting them just to make sure you like them. Um, generally, you get what you pay for. Um, the better snowshoes cost more, probably not surprisingly. Um, sometimes you can find used snowshoes uh, at certain places in town, Gear Fix um, or Craigslist. But um, for most people, you don't need to worry too much about the snowshoe that you're buying. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of snowshoes out there, but for the average person who's going out for four, five, six miles of recreational snowshoeing, we can, it, most snowshoes will work just fine for you. Um, if you're seven feet tall uh, or, or short, you may want to make sure you have the right um, snowshoe that fits your, your body type. Um, if you're going on a backcountry trip and carrying a, a 40 pound pack because you're camping for a couple of days, you want to make sure you have the right snowshoe. But for the average day snowshoer, um, most snowshoes will work just fine for you. Um, this one here is a pretty standard model. You can see you've got these teeth here for traction um, as you're walking along the snow. And then a common design here is this metal bar that goes around the edge. Um, there are two two general types of snowshoes you'll see, this, this metal bar with the, the webbing in the, the center there. Um, these are great for most conditions. Um, the other kind you'll see are, are more of a plastic snowshoe uh, throughout. And um, those have a little bit more teeth for traction on the edges. So if it's an icy day, those can work a little bit better. But again, for most conditions, most snowshoes will work just fine for you. Um, you know, the one thing to keep an eye on is how do the buckle systems work? None of them are very complicated, but, um, you know, the better snowshoes have slightly better buckle systems. So you can always try that out in the store. And if it seems like a hassle and you can't get it right, um, then you might want to uh, try a different pair. Um, one, one thing to remember when you're putting your snowshoes on, um, you want these buckles uh, to be pretty tight not so tight that you're going to have, you'll, you'll feel tension anywhere where the strap is on your foot because you're going to end up with blisters. So not too tight, but if they're too loose, uh, especially this back strap here that kind of comes around the back of your heel, um, if this one's too loose, the snowshoe's just going to uh, fall off. Not the end of the world, but you put it back on a little tighter than you had it before. Um, so that's a um, uh, couple, couple tips there on snowshoes. Um, 
we'll come back to a, a few other gear things. Um, polls are another uh, question I get asked about a lot. Um, one, my, my main advice on poles is if you like to hike with poles, you're gonna like to snowshoe with poles. You don't need them. Um, if you're out on a longer trip or with steeper elevation gain loss, um, and probably most importantly, like if you think it's gonna be an icy day, poles can, can help. Or if you're really getting out adventurous and you know, you're gonna have river crossings or stuff like that, poles can be helpful, but you don't need them. But if you have them, great. Um, and the, the type of pole that works best for snowshoeing are the extendable kind. Um, if you have a fixed length pole, that can be a little bit of an issue under certain conditions. If, if you get a whole bunch of snow and then people kind of blaze through on that snowshoe trail, you're gonna basically find that that trail, that it becomes a trough that is exactly two snowshoes wide. And so your poles, uh, you know, you'll be at, the snowshoes will sit at the bottom of the, the, the trough and then you'll be pulling, and you're gonna have your poles up here because they're gonna be up on, on the top of the higher snow. Um, so if you can adjust that with adjustable poles, all the better, um, but you can always figure it out um, if, if you just have one type of pole. And you can use one pole, two poles. Um, it's all, all good on the poles front. Um, and then uh, one, one tip uh, regarding gear is um, when you drive up to go snowshoeing, you're, you know, it's the morning time, it's the coldest part of the day, you get out of the car, you're, that's as cold as you're going to be all day is most likely right when you get out of the car, and you're going to put on two hats and every layer you've got, um, and then 10 minutes up the trail, you're going to start overheating, so hopefully you dressed with uh, layers so that you can uh, find just the, the right combination of uh, clothing, to, so you're not overheating, but you're warm enough as well. Um, and then um, another, another bit of equipment that can be helpful is uh, these are gaiters, very, very simple piece of equipment here. They just wrap around your, your lower calf and then your boot comes out the bottom here. There's a little strap here that will go under your heel. Um, and this basically just covers up that gap between your, your snow pants and your boots so that you're not getting snow going into your, uh, your boots and, and making for cold, wet feet. Um, so gaiters are great. You don't need them. Mostly you will need gaiters if you have, um, uh, it's like a powder day and you know you're going to be off trail. That's when you probably want to have gaiters because you're going to be in deeper snow and sloshing around. So um, that's the best time. Um, so there's a question. The, the next item on gear is what type of footwear is best? Um, so the ideal thing is uh, if you have snow boots. Um, and I've got a picture of my snow boots, but you know, any snow boots, unless they're like, you know, those massive kinds of snow boots uh, for the Arctic, most snow boots will fit just fine in your snowshoes, uh, no problem. Um, adjust the straps and off you go. You can also use hiking boots. Uh, those work just fine. They work great. That's what most people use. Um, waterproof is helpful, but it's not as important, I think, as most people think it is for snowshoeing. Um, it's good, but it's, it's not, not necessarily essential. Um, it's, you know, winter time. And so unless it's raining or snowing really hard, the, the snow is mostly frozen. So it's not melting through your boot constantly. So again, waterproof is helpful, but, um, not, not always, uh, key. And then I, you know, I honestly, I have seen, uh, people wear sneakers, tennis shoes, uh, with snowshoes and that'll work too. Um, if it's a stormy day and there are, um, you know, a lot of snow and you're in deep snow, don't go out with tennis shoes and sneakers. That's uh, really going to be um, pretty uh, uncomfortable for your feet because your feet are going to get all kinds of snow in those shoes and they're going to be cold just because tennis shoes and sneakers are, are thinner. So um, really want to try to have the, the, the bigger boots, but, um, you know, and again, low tops are, are fine, um, but really the, the, the snow shoes are the best, uh, or sorry, the, the snow boots would be the, your ideal. Um, so I, I've noticed there are a few questions popping up, um, uh, trying to get through this and then we'll get through to some questions. So Aaron, if you wanna keep track of those and there's a way to turn it off so I'm not getting distracted by those, that would be great. Um, if not, no worries. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll come back to any other questions on footwear. Um, and then just like with uh, any time you're going out hiking, 
you know, bring food, extra food, extra water. Um, that's always important. Um, and then this is a, a moment to get your pen out and make a note. Um, one of the really helpful tips I have for you is here in Central Oregon, there's, a, there's an app or anywhere, um, there's an app you can get for your phone uh, that is really helpful. It's called PDF Maps, a uh, really simple name. It's made by a company called Avenza. And uh, maybe we'll, we'll, in the email we send out um, after this is over, I think it'll go out tomorrow, we'll, we'll make a note of that uh, app. But basically, it's a very simple app. All it does is um, you download a trail map onto your phone and you open it in this app. And all it, it doesn't do a lot, but what it does do, it does very well. So it just shows you that trail map and it puts a blue dot on the trail map where you are. Um, so it uses, even if you're out, off, out of cell range, um, this app will use the GPS function in your phone. So it will find where, it will know where you are on that trail map and show you, uh, which is really helpful um, and, and minimizes the, the potential for getting lost. So uh, PDF maps uh, made by Avenza, very handy. And we're very fortunate here in Central Oregon, um, the Nordic Club and the Forest Service have um, created these PDF maps that are geo-referenced and you can Google them for any of the snow parks, just uh, say for Virginia Meisner uh, trail map, uh, Google that, you'll find exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, very simple and, and we'll, I'll, I'll try to include some links to those maps uh, just for convenience in the email we send out after we're done here. Um, so very helpful uh, to see where you are, especially if you're somewhere new and you don't know the trail systems. I, I use it all the time just to double check uh, sometimes we think we know where we are and we don't always know exactly where we are. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, it is 2020. So on other tips, uh, it's, it's COVID. So being outdoors is a less risky activity. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not gonna pretend to be and give you lots of advice on that front. Um, there's more than enough of it out there. So track that down as far as trail safety goes. Uh, one thing I would just note is uh, from what I've read, it sounds like, you know, those normal fleece neck warmers that a lot of us probably use, um, those are apparently less than helpful. Um, they may actually be unhelpful in spreading the germs. Um, so uh, maybe have your, your regular mask with you if, if you're uncomfortable or, or want to be careful. Um, the other nice thing is if you want to get off the trail and give people space, um, it's a lot better to do that in the wintertime because getting off the trail means you're still on top of a bunch of snow and you're not damaging any vegetation like you are if you're doing that during the summer. Um, so there's that point. And then, um, you, you know, just your 10 essentials, um, lots of different 10 uh, items that uh, different people have listed out there to bring, whether you're hiking or snowshoeing, um, but you know, all, all your first aid kit and all of that good stuff, emergency blanket. Um, I, hopefully most of you know the drill there, but uh, Google 10 essentials if you're, you're curious, what else should be in your backpack anytime you're you're hiking or snowshoeing. Oops. All right, so let's go back to uh, screen share here for next slide. Give me one second. Okay, let me go back up. All right, so some tips for snowshoeing. All right, so. One of the most important things, and, and I, when I've done this presentation before, I, I sometimes say this two times and then people are so passionate about it, they, they bring it up three more times and the question and answer afterwards. So we're just gonna do it once, but we're gonna do it justice here. So um, if you're out on the trail snowshoeing, a lot of times you'll be near or sharing trails with cross country skiers. And you can see, hopefully you can see my cursor here, you've got these very distinct, uh, cross-country ski tracks in, in the snow. And if you're a cross-country skier, you know those are the preferred uh, snow conditions uh, for skiing. You, you have, it's you know, more energy efficient, it's smoother, uh, much, much easier way of uh, cross-country skiing. And if a snowshoer is to walk on top of those uh, ski tracks, that you pretty much pack them all down and they're gone. Even just one person will do that. Um, so, that's a no-no, that's, that's the big no-no of snowshoeing. Um, so don't do that. Um, while we snowshoers sometimes have uh, poles with us, cross-country skiers always have poles with them. They will use them as weapons against you if they find you packing down their ski tracks. So be very careful there um, and try not to do that. I will caveat that, you know, if you look at this other trail here, 
Um, you know, you could kind of see, okay, maybe a, a cross country skier went through there. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, that's not a well defined, too, too clear ski tracks. Um, and the other caveat there is, you know, if you find yourself in a narrow spot on the trail where there's a drop off on one side of the trail and the only safe spot is to trample over some ski tracks, go for it. Safety always wins out um, and don't worry about that. And then when it's safe to uh, veer off and, and get back onto a, a parallel track. All right. Um, so one key thing that you want to make sure you don't do with snowshoes is uh, a couple of tips here. So I'm actually going to come out of sharing mode. So when you look at these, your, your boot goes into the foot pad here and you get this sort of swing function where the rest of the snowshoe, the heel, as you every take every step you take, this tail end of the snowshoe will will uh, kind of drag across the ground. And, and that's how you want it to be. Um, now, if you think about this, and what will happen is if you lift up your foot off the ground to take a step and you decide you want to step backwards, what's going to happen is you're going to have this tail dig into the snow and then you're going to fall over backwards. And we don't want to do that. It may be fun. It may be a soft landing, but we're going to, we're going to try to avoid falling, back, falling down when we're snowshoeing. Uh, so don't do that. Uh, just go forward, go you know, make your little turns instead of trying to go backwards. Um, also, one key thing to remember when you're putting the snowshoe on is um, don't put your foot too far forward. So this snowshoe model here, you can see it has a bit of a guard here. So I can't, I couldn't put my boot any further than this guard right here. And that's great. That keeps me from pushing it too far forward. If my boot goes so far forward that it starts rubbing on here, then what's going to happen is every time I take a step, um, the whole snowshoe is just going to step. It's not going to have this swing function. And so you're going to have to carry the weight of the whole snowshoe rather than letting the back drag along. So um, that's one thing. You know, the rest of the straps should be pretty self explanatory. Um, I've seen people put snowshoes on frontwards and backwards. I haven't seen sideways yet, but. Um, that's the one thing you really want. It should be pretty straightforward. Um, just don't put the, the snowshoe too far forward. Um, another tip uh, when you're heading out snowshoeing is um, if you're not an early morning person like myself, um, that might make your trip a little bit easier. If you're the first person out today after a big snowstorm last night, you're going to be the first one cutting trail. And the cutting trail is a lot of work if there's a lot of fresh snow. Um, on a trail that you might be able to go eight miles on with your fitness level on a normal day with a packed trail, you may do two miles and be exhausted if you're cutting trail by yourself. If you're with two people, trade off. That makes it a lot easier. Um, or just uh, sleep in, let somebody else cut the trail, and then you can come in and enjoy the fruits of their labor. And, and as you're heading in and you see them coming out, you can thank them for, for breaking trail and doing that hard work. Um, and, and that kind of leads to another uh, important piece of snowshoeing. Um, you know, how difficult is any given trail is it, it changes based on snow conditions. Um, so you may talk to someone who does some uh, trail, did some trail last weekend and they'll say, oh yeah, it was super easy. And then you go out and you're cutting fresh tracks in that snow and you're like, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. And it's the same trail and you're both in equal fitness shape. Um, that is very much a factor snowshoeing. Most of the time, most of our trails here, you know, unless you get up really early, somebody's probably packed them down already. So not a huge issue, but if you're going off on a less used trail, a little bit more of an issue. Um, so keep that in mind. The other, the other conditions can also be a factor. So uh, if it's an icy day, if there is an ice storm, you don't want to go snowshoeing. Um, that's no fun. You're going to fall down it's, and it's not soft landings then. Um, but that's again, that's, you know, sometimes it's a, a good snow condition day in most places and then you'll get to one spot where it might be a little icy and that's where you're going to want to make sure you've got those sharp teeth on, on the bottom of your uh, snowshoes uh, fully operational. Um, and then uh, perhaps one of my other, I think, probably most highlight points uh, when you're trying to figure out where to go snowshoeing is it should be based on the weather conditions that day. So two main conditions we'll go through. So if it's a sunny day, take advantage and go somewhere that's out in the open with great views. 
And we, in Central Oregon here, we have a lot of good options on that front. Uh, if it's a stormy day, don't go there. Um, if you're out in the open with views, those views won't be there. The mountains will all be covered in clouds and snow. Um, so you won't see anything and you'll be out in the open, which means you're gonna get more wind and the snow is gonna be in your face. And it's just not as pleasant of an experience. So on those stormy days, you're gonna wanna go to trails that are more in the forest. And I've got a, a map and when we get to the section where we have some suggestions, I'll, I'll give some examples for both. Um, but on stormy days, if you're in the forest, that'll really protect you from uh, from the elements blowing in quite as much, and, and it's a, a better way to, to spend that, that day. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, as far as how far you might snowshoe, um, I, I, I kind of give the, the two to one ratio. So if you're, think you, you know, on a normal hiking day, you can go 10 miles, I would say plan on a five mile snowshoe. Uh, and then, you know, if you can go further, great, and you're feeling good, but as, as a starting reference point, uh, maybe some, some math uh, in that range until um, you kind of get your bearings. And again, it's going to depend on, you know, some days I can go 12 miles on snowshoes. If I'm the only one cutting trail, I might do two or three miles and i am had my fun and I'm going back for hot chocolate and I'm done. Um, and then um, snow park passes. Um, another key thing here, um, all of the place, almost all of the places where you're going to go snowshoeing, uh, you'll be parking at a snow park and it is required to have that little uh, snow park pass in your window and you can get those at um, pretty much any outdoor shop in town. Uh, you can get a day, a day uh, pass, which is I think $5 and then a seat or a season uh, pass, which is I think 25. I believe if you can get these at the DMV as well and there's no markup because it's technically through them. Um, and I believe REI also doesn't have a markup. There may be other places uh, that don't have a markup, um, but that's, uh, that's what I know on that front. Um, and then the other thing on snow parks is uh, some snow parks are shared between cross country skiers and snowshoers and snowmobilers. Um, I'm sure snowmobiles are super fun, but um, being in a snow park with snowmobilers is not awesome. It's not a place to hang out and enjoy a snowy afternoon. The snowmobiles are loud. They stink. Um, as in their exhaust is really stinky and they tend to, I don't know why this is, but they tend to run their engines uh, in place for a while, to maybe let them warm up or something when you're in a snow park. Um, and, and you don't want to be around to um, just hang out and, and soak that in. The good news is our snow parks, and again, credit to the Nordic Club and Forest Service and others, uh, most snow parks have a great design where we all park here and, and, and share the snow park and then the snowmobilers go off that way, cross country skiers and snowshoers go off this way and so five minutes down the trail you've heard your last snow sh or your, your last snowmobile uh, engine until you get back to the snow park. Not every trail but in general um, that seems to work out well more often than not. Um, and then another question we get is uh, are dogs allowed on these trails? And so there's a, a pretty simple rule of thumb on that front with um, uh, Cascade Lakes Highway, which is where, again, most of our snow parks are. As you head out towards Mount Bachelor, anything on the north side of the highway, dogs are not allowed. Um, so that's Meisner, Swampy. And then if you're on the south side of the highway, the Sun River side of the highway, uh, dogs are allowed. Um, so you can, and you, again, you can kind of Google that ahead of time so you know uh, and aren't, uh, any rules on that front. All right, so let's go back to screen share here. All right, um, so again, uh, you know, hats off to the Nordic Club. They go out and hang a lot of these trail markers and they'll have a snowshoe or a cross country skier on them. Um, and you'll see those in the trails um, which is really great. And, and you know, they're every so often. So a lot of the times you can see from one marker to the next um, and they're unobtrusive. So it's, it's a, a nice way to make sure you're still on the trail. So that's great. Um, hey Eric, you're in, you're in um, note sharing mode. If you can go uh, back to full screen. Shared the wrong screen. Hang on a second. Thanks for catching that, Aaron. Okay. That one. Okay, is that better? Yep. Excellent. 
Okay. Uh, so another tip for when you get to your lunch break, you know, you probably, you've been out, you're warmed up and you're like, I'm going to have a nice leisurely lunch, just scout things out, take some pictures. Eventually I'll work my way through my, my peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, plan on a short lunch. Um, even if you're warmed up, it's cold out there most days and your body temp's going to start coming down fairly quickly. Um, so a couple tips on that front. Um, get, get eat your lunch and then if you're still warm, hang out and enjoy the views and everything. Um, and there are these, uh, these really light little pads you can get. They're, you know, this thing weighs probably, you know, a quarter of an ounce kind of thing. You can just stuff it in the corner of your backpack. At a lot of events you go to, you, sometimes they give these out for free. You sit on them at concerts in the summer. Um, they can also buy you a little bit of time at lunch when you're um, sitting on the snow. Because when you're sitting on the snow, you're going to really start losing a lot of body heat through that snow. Um, and so the other, the other tip on lunchtime is you probably don't want to take your snowshoes off. Um, there's, uh, you, you can, but you know, then you got to uh, put the, you know, do all the buckles again and, and you might as well skip that. So my recommendation is how to, how to get from standing in snowshoes to sitting down. Um, you can just sort of do the, the fall back if it's a nice soft landing or just uh, go down on all fours and then roll over onto your back. So you're sitting down and then you prop your uh, snowshoes up like I've got them in the picture here. Pretty comfortable, pretty easy. And then you don't have to worry about putting them back on. And then to stand up from this position, uh, unless you can jump up from that position, which is really tough, um, you just roll back over onto your hands and knees, on, roll over onto your side, and then your hands and knees, and then you just stand right up nice and easy. Um, so those are my lunch tips. Uh, and then this is what you don't want to have happen. So this is, uh, as you can see here, got my big snow boots on, I got my snowshoe, and I have like 20 pounds of a snowball on the bottom of my snowshoe. Um, this is not good. Uh, this means you're carrying a whole lot of weight with every step and it makes it a little easier to twist your ankle. So you want to try to avoid this. The only time this really happens is when you're out snowshoeing on a warm day. Um, most of the winter, this isn't gonna happen, non-issue. Most people, when they get this snow, these snowballs on the bottom, you just click your snowshoes and, and that does it. it. It doesn't really do it. You gotta then click your snowshoes again, you know, eight seconds later and then again and again, it's kind of a pain. Um, what I have found that helps some is, because uh, when you click them together, you don't get all the snow off and then it quickly just snow sticks to snow. So what, what you, I find it works best is take your snowshoe off, uh, whack all that snow off the bottom of your snowshoe and then you'll get a, another good chunk of time uh, without having those snowballs. I have read that what some people do is they will put uh, duct tape on the bottom of the foot pad of the snowshoe and snow is a little less likely to stick to it. Um, but again, on, on sunny days from everyone I've ever talked to and every, my experiences, um, sometimes this just happens and it's, it's kind of a pain on those. It is, but it's a nice sunny warm day. So the rest of the conditions are a little easier, but um, there are a few trip, tips and tricks for uh, how to make that a little bit better on that front. All right, safety. So a couple points here, and, and I, I always worry about this part of the presentation because I, snowshoeing is one of the safer things you can do out there um, in the woods and on public lands. Um, but I, I'm going to give you all these things, and I, I worry that it makes it like, oh my gosh, it's super dangerous because there's all these things I got to think about. We're, we're, we're talking about very much the margins here and just some some friendly suggestions for safety. This is uh, generally speaking, you don't hear a lot of news stories about people snowshoeing and getting hurt, um, but nonetheless, it can happen. So best to be prepared. Um, one of the things to watch out for are tree wells. Um, snow falls down, so you can see my cursor here. Um, you got the snow accumulates in the tree instead of underneath the tree. And so you have this sort of hollow area with no snow. And if you're walking too close, you can slide down into that tree well. And here, here we've got a photo that kind of shows uh, a, a four or five foot deep uh, tree well. And in this case, you can see where that tree well is. It's not hiding. Um, but in general, if you're walking along on a snowshoe trail that's already been packed down, somebody else has already blazed that trail 
and they didn't fall into a tree well, so you're just fine following that trail. This is more if you're off in the woods exploring, getting to, you know, really close to trees. So something to be careful about. Um, and, and again, this tends to be more common after uh, a, a series of big snowstorms. Um, and here's a, a little eight second video of sort of the, the worst case scenario you want to watch out for. You see this tree here, not a very big tree, no obvious tree well, but check this out. Yeah, so he's not even touching the bottom there. So watch out for the tree wells, uh, be careful. Um, here's another thing to watch out for. Sometimes after there's a lot of snow, a lot of it's up in the trees on branches. Um, and you'll sometimes you'll, you'll feel a little bit of snow falling down out of the branches. And the normal inclination is to look up and see where's that snow coming from. Um, you don't wanna catch snowballs in your face, even if they're small ones. And sometimes as you can see in this photo, there are big snowballs, you know, 200 pound snowballs in the trees. Um, I've never heard of this actually happening to anyone. Um, so this is more a little bit of comic relief. But uh, if you do find the snow is falling down as you're walking through, just keep walking, take a few more steps, keep your head down, and then turn around and look up and, and admire the tree and watch the snow falling. Um, all right, a couple other things to watch out for. Um, as I said, a lot of trails have uh, those markers. So it's great, just follow the markers. Um, but if two or three people are the first ones out and they're like going to this secret place that only they know, um, they may have gone off on just some random area that's not the designated trail. And if two or three people do that, that will look, when you're out there, that will look like that's where the trail goes because that's where the snowshoe route seems to be where people have gone. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, we, I've done that where there's the main trail and it's, I've been with a couple of people and we're like, let's, let's get off the trail and, and go find a, a nice spot for lunch, you know, just 15, 20 feet off the trail. So we go, we get behind some trees to a nice little area and everybody on the trail behind us then follows us right to our lunch spot, realizes this is not the trail and then goes back to the main trail. So just be aware, keep track of uh, where the trail is um, and, and have you always have your maps. Um, another great tip is, uh, and, and, and this can be counterintuitive sometimes, but if the, this, the trail is really packed down, you may think, oh, you know, what? I'm just gonna take my snowshoes off. My snow boots are good. I got traction, I'll be fine. Keep your snowshoes on. Um, snow trails are notorious for changing conditions. You might have an icy step and then a bunch of uh, nicely packed trail and then you have another icy step. Those teeth on the bottom of your snowshoes will really help you from slipping. The other thing you'll see a lot of times out on snowshoe trails is somebody who took their snowshoes off and started, you know, took 10 or 12 steps, and you'll see a, a hole in the ground um, that goes down two feet, where we call it post holing, where somebody just went right down into the snow, and and you can twist an ankle, you know, and it's just not fun to do that. So keep your snowshoes on, even if you think you can do just fine without them, um, you, you'll be better off that way. Uh, on the safety front, you know, kind of like with hiking, always good to let someone know where you are, let them know what time you'll be back, and, and do your check-ins. Um, for the health of your snowshoes, um, again, you've got these sharp teeth on the bottom of the snowshoe. Uh, you wanna keep that sharp for when you're out and you find an icy spot. And if you are uh, wearing your snowshoes on pavement or you find a section of the trail that for some reason is it's thin on snow and there's rocks, um, don't, don't walk on rocks or pavement that will dull those teeth. Um, so definitely try to avoid that. Just take your snowshoes off, put them back on if you need to. Um, and when you get there and you get there in the morning, don't put your snowshoes on at the car if it's just bare pavement. A lot of times the snow parks have been plowed, but there's still a snowpack. Um, so you can just put them on there and it's fine. But if it's pavement, don't put them on until you get out of the snow park and you're on snow. All right. Uh, so enough of the logistics, where to go. So here's a, here's a map that shows uh, Bend is over here, and you take uh, Cascade Lakes Highway out here. Eventually, you get to Mount Bachelor, Tunnel Mountain, um, and so this uh, identifies where some of the uh, the more common uh, snow parks are. Uh, so to get to Skyliners and the Tunnel Falls uh, Trail, uh, just take Skyliners Road right out of downtown Bend, and that'll uh, get you up here. It's the only, really the only one out there. 
Um, there's a couple spots right at the end where you can park and, and do different routes. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But um, most people find themselves out here on Cascade Lakes Highway. And again, uh, if you're north at Virginia Meisner, Swampy Lakes, no dogs. If you're south of the highway, dogs are welcome. Um, and then uh, this, this road here is the one, uh, the road that get, takes you down to Sun River uh, for reference point there. And, and I'm going to point out the Edison Butte Snow Park right here as well. And then uh, Dutchman Flat over here, right between Mount Bachelor and Tumalo. So Edison Butte, this is one of uh, my favorites, not as popular, not as crowded as Meisner and Swampy. Um, and, and just, this is such a neat place. Uh, great old growth forest, Ponderosa pine. Um, there are a few spots where you get little views, but this isn't really about the views. Um, there are a lot of like lava rock areas that when they're totally covered in snow in the winter, they just look like big marshmallow fields. Um, so Edison Butte is great, especially on a stormy day. Uh, this is a really fun place to go. And there are a couple different snowshoe trails that you can do there. Um, so check that out. Um, and then Tumalo Mountain, um, this is hard to beat on a clear day. So again, Edison Butte, great on a stormy day because you're protected in the forest, um, not as much storm coming into your face. Um, and then on a clear sunny day, if you've got the stamina to get up Tumalo Mountain, uh, it, the views are hard to beat. You're, this is a photo from the summit there. Uh, you've got South Sister, Broken Top, the other sisters. You've got, uh, you can see all, all, a whole bunch of the Cascade Range uh, from up there. It's, it's one of the better views in Central Oregon. Be careful if you look at a map of Tumalo Mountain and say, oh, it's just like a mile and a half or whatever it is to the top. It may be a short distance uh, route, but it is uh, very steep. It's up the whole way. Um, and the trail is also, there is a trail, but it's really hard to find. Um, most people are just, you know, you'll see tracks going this way up to the summit and trails going up this way and this way and somebody's doing more switchbacks. And so you'll see all kinds of different routes going up. Um, so the, the general rule of thumb is as long as you're going up, you're eventually going to get to the summit. Um, and this is, uh, you park at Dutchman to get there. And Dutchman's a tricky snow park uh, because there's, it's a very small one. There's not as much parking. Um, so keep that in mind, uh, especially on the weekends. Um, but uh, yeah, again, so, you know, have a map and make sure, you know, be careful you don't get lost. Uh, but if you get up there and on it's, it's a clear day, wow, uh, just wow. Um, all right, and then uh, as you go out Skyliners, you've got Tumalo Falls, which is totally spectacular um, in the wintertime. You've got, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times, depending on how cold it's been, the falls will be partially frozen. Um, you've got, you can, the, the road that takes you to the uh, beginning of the trail to the falls is gated in the winter. So you drive as far as you can, park there, uh, a couple different spots where you can park. Um, be careful, a lot of people do some sort of rando parking there. So park where you're supposed to park, not dangerously. Um, and then you can just go right up the road or there's a, a trail that basically parallels the road on the other side of Tumalo Creek. Um, Tumalo Creek is a uh, proposed wild and scenic river. So hopefully we'll have some uh, new protections there uh, someday soon. Um, and yeah, hi highly recommend checking this out. You check out my cursor, you can actually snowshoe all the way up along the edge here, and you'll see a couple of people here, red and blue jackets. Be careful, be very careful if you do go up here. Um, there are guardrails, but those guardrails are all buried uh, under a lot of snow. So you're going to want to make sure to stay clear away from the edge because, you know, it's slippery and it's a long way down and it's probably a one-way trip down. So uh, be careful there, but great spot. And then uh, a little one you've probably not heard of. Uh, off the beaten track. Uh, if you head out towards the town of Sisters, go past Sisters, uh, heading towards Black Butte, just before you get to Black Butte Ranch, uh, there's a place called Glaze Meadow. There's not an official trail here. There's not an official snow park here. But if you want to get out and be somewhere pretty much by yourself, this is a great place to go. Um, the, the place to park is I think the, what is it, the, the crossroad there is uh, Indian Ford, uh, or Indian Springs Road, and typically they'll plow an extra wide spot at that intersection and just kind of keep an eye out and be safe, uh, and you got to cross the road, have a map, 
head in towards Glaze Meadow, um, beautiful old growth ponderosa pine. And when you get to the meadow, you've got some great views of the Three Sisters. This one's only good and only doable when we have low elevation snow. So keep that in mind. If you were to go out there uh, for a good part of the winter, there's usually not snow there. So it's more of a, uh, a special occasion off the beaten trail option for you. All right, and then Crater Lake, uh, perhaps Oregon's most iconic uh, landmark and uh, most spectacular scenery. Don't go here on a stormy, cloudy day. You won't be able to see the lake and it'll be miserable. Um, definitely check it out on a clear day. Um, it is uh, a view uh, un unmatched, um, really is a special, a special view in the wintertime. Arguably, Crater Lake is even more impressive in the winter than the summer, but it's a competition. Um, and, and to get there in the wintertime, that normal entrance you would take in the summer on the north entrance, that's closed. So you come in through the south entrance. Um, you don't have to go all the way to Klamath Falls, but you go that direction and then you cut up towards the park. So uh, just be sure Google doesn't send you the wrong way through the north entrance there. All right. Uh, Ochoco Mountains. Not a lot of people know about the Ochoco Mountains, but I think they're becoming a little bit more discovered again as the Cascades get a little bit more discovered and more crowded. Ochoco Mountains are great. There's uh, Walton Lake is great for snowshoeing. There's a snow park there. Lookout Mountain, a little more of an adventure, a little bit longer trek, but also great. Um, and then uh, this one is uh, perhaps the ultimate. Uh, if you are looking for a romantic snowshoe, uh, you combine snowshoes and a full moon in the winter on a clear night. That's key. Uh, it, you'll, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, you have the full moon, which really just reflects off the snow and it can feel almost like daytime. Bring your headlamp, bring your backup flashlight and your backup backup flashlight and all those safety precautions times two because it's nighttime. Um, but uh, full moon snowshoe trek is uh, perhaps one of the more romantic things one can do in Oregon. Um, I, I may have proposed to my now wife on a full moon snowshoe trip. And uh, I think when you propose on a full moon snowshoe hike, the odds of getting a yes answer go way up. So there, there's my, my hot romantic tip a uh, couple months before Valentine's Day. But you kind of got to time the weather. You know, winter, you know, winter can be tricky. So here in Central Oregon, we're a little lucky, a little luckier than if you're talking about say Mountain Hood where it's more likely to be snowed in, but still watch the weather, extra safety precautions. All right, winding down here. If you want to get more involved with Oregon Wild, uh, please do, please become a member. Um, we can't do the things we do to protect these amazing places that I've just been showing you photos of um, without your support. We're a nonprofit um, and we're only as, as strong as, as the members that support us. Um, and lots of other ways uh, you can also get involved. You can volunteer, not as many volunteers during COVID year, but um, still some ways to do that. Um, you can call your member of Congress and encourage them uh, to do everything they can to pr better protect our public lands, our natural treasures, our wild and scenic rivers, um, attend their virtual town halls, weigh in, submit a question. Um, and, and if you happen to own a business, uh, perhaps your business can uh, support Oregon Wild financially or endorse uh, a protection of a, a natural treasure uh, or a wild and scenic river that we're, we're seeking protection for. So shoot me an email and, and we'll uh, try and help get you connected there. And always, you know, the old uh, standby of writing letters to the editor, happy to help walk people through that, but that's a great way to influence politics and um, help protect our, our special places and our natural treasures for, so that future generations can enjoy these places um, as we do today. You know, I think we, we take for granted a lot of our natural treasures here. They're just our backyard. It's always been there, but these places don't protect themselves. So please join Oregon Wild, become a member um, and, and help us protect these places. So um, with that, Aaron, I'm going to turn it over to you and I think we can do some Q&A. Yes, uh, we've got a couple questions. Uh, I did not know that was your proposal, Eric. Uh, coincidentally, I proposed on a full moon on a sand dune in Death oh, Valley. Nice. So it's kind of a similar nice. landscape, very different temperature yeah. levels. Yes. Um, <laughs> Oregon but, Wildlands uh, think alike. <laughs> um, one person asked, where do you, 
are you willing to share where exactly you proposed? Ah, uh, yes, that was uh, up on Mount Hood in the White River Canyon. Uh, that's right off of Highway 35, um, big snow park there, easy access, and you're, you're right on the mountain there. So great views. Um, but lo again, lots of places. Um, I've, I've been up Tumalo Mountain on a full moon. Uh, we did it last year. We timed it uh, so that we got, we were going up at sunset and then the moon came up by the time we were at the summit. I mean, I don't know if you can always line it up that well, but um, Tumalo is great. But any, any open area, it's just, it's really cool to be out there in the snow at night. Cool in all definitions. <laughs> Um, two people asked uh, if you had any tips for getting out of a tree well if you happen to fall into one. Ah, great question. Yes, I downhill ski, so I think about these things a little bit as well. Um, it's more, more of a risk with downhill skiing, but um, yeah, getting out is tough. One of the, the pieces of advice that I have heard is um, you want to hug that tree trunk, um, grab that, grab a branch, you know, a lot of times you don't like just, you know, that video showed somebody very intentionally quickly falling in. More often than not, it's like a lose my balance and I'm all of a sudden I'm sort of sliding down um, and losing control. So you, you have a moment there where you can try to grab onto some branches. The key thing is you want to try to keep your head up and your feet down. Um, the opposite makes everything more difficult. Um, and being with other people, um, that, that's uh, perhaps the best way to get out is have somebody who can pull you out. Um, does it matter, do snowshoes have a left and a right? Uh, you know, funny question. Uh, I am sure that I have worn the right on the left and the left on the right uh, more than a few times. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes the only real difference is very minor, like that the straps are dangling on the outside instead of the inside. So if, if they do, you'll typically see an R and an L um, on the snowshoe. So keep an eye out for that. Um, but, you know, it, it's not the worst mistake to make on, on most snowshoes. Some, they won't fit at all very well if you get them backwards or, or left to right. So keep, keep an eye out on that. But yeah. Do the... Um... Does the rubber or any part of the uh, snowshoe degrade if you're keeping them like in a cold garage? You know, I've not heard anyone reporting that. Um, I, I don't think they would. I mean, these are designed to be used outdoors. So um, they're, they're kind of built for the cold. Um, you know, that said, you've got some parts on there that are rubber and plastic. And so, you know, if they're in your garage, and they're, you know, 100 degrees in the summer, 110 degrees in the summer, and then they are cooled down. I, I, you know, it could cut some life off the year of the, the life of, cut some time off the life of the snowshoe, but it, it's not something I would worry too much about. Um, another person asked, yeah, we'll, we'll include some information about the PDF program that Avenza makes in the follow-up email, but I'll say, and uh, send this to everybody. Um, great, now I've lost my question sheet. Uh, where did you go? Yeah, well, um, you know, looking for hiking with dogs. Any advice on hiking with dogs? Um, boy, that's a tough question. I'm going to, no matter how I answer it, I'm going to piss off half the audience. So I'm going to tread lightly on this one. Um, you know, I think be careful about following the, um, what, what's, what's, what the rules are. Um, you know, you're going to get a lot more uh, dirty looks from people if dogs are not allowed there or off leash, on leash. Um, so, um, you know, following those rules are in place. Somebody has given some thought to what is most appropriate in that location. So respecting that, I think, goes a long way towards um, acceptance of dogs in other places. So yeah, choosing my words carefully there. Do you have, uh, are, can snowshoe poles be the same as hiking poles or do you need to have a ring like a ski pole? 
Yes, um, I am sure you, if you go to REI, you can get snowshoeing ski poles or snowshoeing poles um, that are in a different rack than uh, the hiking poles, but um, most poles are gonna work just fine. Again, those extendable poles will work best, but um, I, I think if, if you're uh, using any poles that are the right size for you, uh, you'll probably be just fine. And let's see, um, out of them on that, people were asking both in the Q&A and in the chat. So I'm trying to jump, uh, ah, yes, we will be um, videotaping this or this has been videotaped. So we will be emailing this out. Um, also, if you have uh, missed some of our previous webcasts, we do put all of those um, online on OregonWild.org. So we do everything from talking about things that Eric's talking about. We talk about wildlife. We've had um, all sorts of guest presenters coming in um, to talk about uh, various topics that we work on, uh, clean water issues, um, wildlife reintroduction uh, issues. And we've had a series on um, race and the outdoors and racial equity. So you can find all of those in the wild blog section of OregonWild.org. So um, we're continuing to do these and we'll continue to do these presentations next uh, year. So you can always check out stuff that you may have missed at OregonWild.org. Um, and I think that that is, there was one other one that was a little uh, uh, off topic that talked about um, leveraging some recent science on how forests communicate to advocate for protecting Oregon's forested landscapes. And um, I think on that topic, um, we have a person on staff that does comments into all sorts of, of public um, projects that are the timber sales or infrastructure projects. And he sent, he collects all of that information and sends that into agencies. So we use all of those um, latest scientific resources to try to, to um, uh, influence um, decision makers and the folks that work at like the Bureau of Land Management or the Forest Service. Um, one last question, can you recommend a shop for renting or buying snowshoes? Yes, uh, you know, there are a lot of places here in Bend that um, carry them, and I'm, I haven't looked in Sisters, but I'm sure you can get them there as well. So for Central Oregon um, in, in here in Bend, uh, REI has them. Uh, I know CareFix is, is a place I tend to, to really like because they tend to help uh, uh, with secondhand options as well. Um, so uh, those would be two places I would recommend, but I think uh, Sure Shaw's, I think, has them as well, and Powder House, you know, there's a couple different outdoor shops uh, Winter, winter gear shops uh, right along 14th. Uh, so those would be my my top go-tos. I'd, I'd probably start at GearFix and go from there. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for attending. Um, we'll send some more information in the follow-up email. Um, and again, we'll be doing more of these every Wednesday when we come back in January. And thank you, Eric, for that great presentation. Great, thanks everyone. Have a good night.